What's up guys? Welcome to River Park. Thanks for joining our online experience today. You're watching our most recent live experience. If you wanna catch us the next time we're live, we're live every single Sunday at 9 a.m. You can join us here online or you can check it, our experience out at one of our campuses. We wanna to get to know you, so if you're not yet connected, you can either click the Get Connected link or text the word River Park to 97000. We hope this experience blesses you today and hope to see you soon. Thank you. 
today. Thanks for tuning in from wherever you are. It's always an honor and a privilege to have you worship Jesus with us. We hope that your time with River Park blesses you today. Online audience, this is going to be your opportunity to continue to worship by giving. And if you're here in the room, we're going to give you guys a chance to do that uh, a little later in the experience. Um, If you are new at the park, whether you're here in the room or you're watching online, We want to encourage you guys to get connected. Uh, If you're not yet plugged in, if you haven't yet begun to form relationship or get involved around River Park, we want to encourage you to do that. First of all, selfishly, we just want to get to know you. We want to build a relationship with you. And then secondly, we want you to be part of loving God, loving people, and making a difference with us. That's really easy to do. You can just go on our website, riverpark.net right up at the top right corner there's going to be a plus symbol hit that and then click get connected and just follow the steps there and we look forward to getting to know you last but not least i want to give you a heads up on one more thing uh something awesome that we actually kicked off this past week and we're going to be continuing to do moving forward from here and that is wednesday lunchtime prayer y'all we want to pray 
um, in this season especially more than ever. But we want this to be a part of the cultural landscape here at River Park. And so we have kicked off a weekly prayer gathering on Wednesdays. And here's how that works. Beginning at 11 a.m. on through until 1 p.m., the Campus Center, which is the building that looks a lot like a barn, that's because it is one, right over there is going to be open. We're going to have an atmosphere kind of set that's conducive to prayer and worship. And we want to invite you to come up and maybe spend part of your lunch break in prayer, reading the scriptures, and joining together with us in believing Jesus for good things over our city. Uh, at noon on the dot, there's a little bit more of a structured time. You can come and go as you want from 11 to 1 and as you're able. But right at 12 noon, we kind of come together, have some focused points of prayer and take prayer requests. And then we do a little bit of worship as well. So make plans. Come out and join us. We'd love to have you with us on Wednesday. It is a fantastic, fantastic time. Do this for me. Jump up on your feet wherever you are. We're going to take about 30 seconds, maybe on up to 47 seconds. I don't know. Meet somebody that you haven't met. Give them a, uh, a distance hello, a fist bump, maybe even a chicken wing. Get to know somebody. Pastor Marcus is here. to River Park. We're so glad that you're here. If you are a first-time guest, or maybe if you've been coming for a while and want to connect with us, please text River Park to 97000 for an opportunity to connect with us. This will help you get plugged in at River Park, show you all of the amazing things that's happening, and help us get to know you better. Now, if you're wondering what's going on around here at River Park, because there's always, always something going on here at the park, please text keep up to that same number. This will keep you up to date on everything that's happening around here. Discover sessions are happening online. If you have not had an opportunity to go through our Discover sessions, please go to our app or the website and click the link to get signed up today. It's been an amazing day already. Our hope for you is that you will continue experiencing God. We're getting ready to launch a new series today called Mind Games. So get ready. Thanks again for joining us, and welcome to the park. What's up, River Park? If you're doing all right, say yeah. All right, welcome to the park. So glad you're here. Can you do me a favor? Can you give a big, warm welcome to all of our first-time guests? Come on, give it up. Give your hands together. Come on. And here's something I want you to do really special to our online crowd. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being with us today. We're pumped and stoked that you're with us. My name is Marcus Briggs. I want to do something very special today before we get kicked off. I think it's it's often taken for granted, maybe. You know, one or two people don't make a church experience work on a Sunday morning, especially whenever you look at all the things that River Park does, from band to what we do to produce an online experience. There are so many volunteers. We have a very small staff for what we do and the size of church that we are. We have a ton of volunteers. I looked the other day, it's over 200 and something volunteers that serve regularly here at River Park. So I want you to give it up for the amazing volunteers of River Park. Come on. Amen. Thank you guys. I know uh, I, I saw, I would ask the online audience to do the same thing, but the reality is we like to think that the online audience is watching and standing up and doing applause, but they're really just still in bed watching right now. So God bless you. God bless you. We would love to be there too, <laughs> hanging out in bed. 
Uh, my name is Marcus Briggs. For those of you that don't know me, I'm one of the pastors on staff here at River Park, and I am a ball of energy. So if you came expecting some chilled out version of an experience, first of all, I don't know why you came to River Park. And then second of all, I don't know, I, you're going to have to wait until pastor comes back and be back with him another time. But I love to have fun in church. We're going to have some fun. And you picked the perfect day to be here because we're launching a brand new series today called Mind Games. Turn to your neighbor and say Mind Games. Now turn to the other person that you're socially distancing yourself from right now and look at the, and this time don't say anything, just stare at them for a second. Just stare at them. That's a mind game. I'm just saying, like, that's a mind game. Like, I don't know about you, but especially if you had on a mask, it was really a mind game. Like, for me, I've been wondering this entire time, whenever I see somebody, this, by the way, this is the only time this has ever happened in my life. The other day, somebody told me I had beautiful eyes. That's only because they can't see anything else. Like, that's it. Like, it's just you have beautiful eyes. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to start wearing a Zorro mask now or something like that. But, like, it was really awkward. It was really weird. And it's because it was all she could see. I guess that's what she said. You have beautiful eyes. I'm like, you're 40 feet away. You have no clue. Like, you don't know whether I do or not. But I've been wondering this entire time when people are wearing masks, I'm wondering what's going on behind it. Anybody else wondered kind of are they smiling? Are they frowning? Are they sticking their tongue out at me right now? Like, and I really feel sorry for anybody that chews tobacco because it's got to be really difficult. You know, it just keeps coming back or something like that. I don't know. I feel like 2020 has been one giant mind game. Like somebody's going to pop up one day and say, gotcha. You know, like that's what 2020 feels like. By the way, my wife, she sent me a meme the other day, and I thought it was hilarious of what 2020, if 2020 were a slide, it'd be a cheese grater. For sure, because like it, that's what it feels like. And I feel like 2020 has been this giant mind game. I'm a parent. I have three awesome kids. Come on, can I get it up? Get anybody, all the parents in the house? Come on. Yeah, three awesome kids uh, who also act like demons sometimes. So it's, you know, it's the blessing and the curse of having kids. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all don't, but like they're amazing. They're great kids. But as a parent, I am in the business of mind games. And all my parents know what I'm talking about. And if you've ever been around kids, you know this too. Because what we do with, as parents to make our kids do something that they need to do, but they don't want to do, but we really want them to do it, we have to play a mind game on them. So we start saying things like this. We're like, hey, Santa knows what you're doing right now. And you're not going to get any Christmas gifts. It's January. We're making Christmas promises right now. It's a mind game. Or we do something like this when we want them to eat something really special. It's like squash. And we're like, hey, it's not squash. It's yellow watermelon. You're going to love it. It's awesome. Hey, it's not broccoli. It's actually a green Jolly Rancher. It's awesome. It's like we, we play mind games. And I do this thing with my son. He's the youngest. And sometimes he gets to this point where he just doesn't want to eat anymore. He's like, he's tapped out and he needs to eat a little bit more because he's skinny, man. I mean, he is just skinny. And I'm trying to get him to eat a little bit more. But he gets to this point where he don't even say words. He just, mm, mm, mm. And one, he knows you're not supposed to open your mouth because he knows if he opens his mouth, I'm throwing food in there. So he just, mm, like that. So we have to play a mind game. What do we do? We get the fork out. Y'all know, y'all know what I'm talking about. The airplane, you know, it's like, you start flying that thing around. As soon as he goes, oh, you go, and just stick it right down his throat and let him have it right then and there. But you have to do a mind game to get something to happen with your kids. I still, to this day, even without my kids, I like playing mind games. I like playing tricks on people. I'm, I'm sorry. I do. Uh, the other day I had to uh, fly to Atlanta. Uh, during in the midst of all this COVID stuff. And if you thought getting on an airplane was crazy before, getting on an airplane now, it's an act of Congress, man. And so like you go through all this stuff and I finally get on the plane and I had just used the restroom and washed my hands before boarding the plane. But when I boarded the plane, the stewardess actually hands me this little packet and it's a Purell wipe. And so I'm like, okay, thank you. I'll use it later because I just washed my hands. So I go and sit in my seat and everything's social distanced and everything like that. So I don't have anybody sitting beside me, but there's somebody sitting across the aisle and they're, they're coming to the point where they're going to serve food during this flight and they don't serve food like they used to. It's no longer giving you a chip. What would you like to drink or anything like that? It's a giant Ziploc bag 
with everything in it, and you got a bottle of water, a little bottle of water, and you've got some like chips and some cookies, and it's all put together. And inside that also is another little Purell pack that you squeeze and put on your hands, and they want you to wipe your hands down before you eat because you could have touched things on the plane that could hurt you or something like that. It could give you COVID. And so everybody's trying to do this, right? So this guy is sitting over there, and when the lady's between us with her little cart, he can't see what I'm doing. She gives me my food, and I lay it all out, including the Purell pack that was in there. But I remembered, I still have my wipes that I haven't used yet. So I take out the wipe that they gave me whenever I came in, and I begin to wipe my hands. And I wipe my hands down with the wipe, put it to the side, and my Purell pack is still sitting on my little tray in front of me at this point. The guy beside me, when the lady moves, notices my Purell thing is still sitting in front of me. And I don't know if you've ever had this. I start eating, and I can, have you ever had that moment where you just feel somebody judging you? I can feel this dude's eyes. Like, I can't see his face because he got that mask on. You know what I'm saying? But, like, like, I feel his eyes. He's like, oh, you're one of those. Like, I just know it. I know that's what's going on in this moment. He's like, he's like judging me from a distance. And so I realize what's going on. And I know what happened is he doesn't realize I wipe my hands with something else. He thinks that Purell pack is there and that I just don't care. So I really, I just start milking it, man. I'm going to play a mind game with this guy. I just start eating. I start licking my fingers. I start doing all kinds of stuff to like really just get in his head. And then at the very end, whenever I realize really what's going on, I really want to make it happen. I, I play, I pull the all, best mind game ever. I do this at the very end. When I get through eating my food, I make sure I clear my throat. So he looks my way again. I go, uh, 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 and then I take out the Purell pack and wipe my hands after I'm through eating my food. Just to mess with you. And I could see him literally roll his eyes in this point. It was all a mind game. We play mind games to convince ourselves of things that aren't actually true. We do it. We even do it to ourselves. We do it to ourselves. It's whenever you can't fit into last year's clothes and you're like, hey, babe, my muscles must have gotten bigger. No, that's a mind game. Your muscles are smaller, actually. Yeah, that's fat. That was a mind game. Or we do stuff like where we're trying to convince ourselves of something like this. We're like, hey, you know what? Today's my cheat day, so I can eat whatever I want. Yeah, it's your 800th cheat day in a row. You know what I'm saying? Just call it a cheat year. Call it what it is, right? Like, so we play mind games to try and get ourselves this way. But here's what I've discovered as humanity. This is something that's very important. We actually do it in a negative sense many times. Have you ever caught yourself saying, I always screw this up? Or I never get that right? When you use phrases like always and never, you're actually playing a mind game that is causing you to do something, and it can be a huge detriment to yourself because it's a negative sense. And the reality is that's not true. You don't always do it that way. It's never that way. No, no, no. It's, it's, that's not always the truth. But the problem is we convince ourselves through a mind game. Paul, one of the writers of the New Testament and wrote a big portion of the New Testament, uh, he wrote the book of Romans, and when he's writing to the Romans, he actually covers this point of a mind game. He says this in Romans chapter 7, verse 22, and this is what we're going to build this entire series off of. He said, I love God's law with all my heart. Everybody say all. All. Come on, everybody say all. If you're watching online, you're excused. We know your wife's still asleep beside you. That's all right. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. So he says, I love God with all my heart, but there's another power that's at war. Where's it at war? With my mind. It's not with my heart. It's with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. This power makes me a slave to the problems that I used to have. The sin that I thought I had done with, it just keeps popping up because this power is at war with my mind. Come on, can anybody be like, dude, Paul, you're writing my story, man. Come on, you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel this way, and I want you to understand this. Whether you realize it or not, you are in the middle of a mind game. You may not know it. You may not realize it, but you're in the middle of a mind game. And this is something that you have to understand. How you set your mind determines how you see yourself. If you're taking notes, this is something good to write down. How you set your mind determines how you see yourself. How you set your mind determines... How, by the way, if you want notes, 
You can actually download our app, and on our app, front page of our app, my notes are sitting right there, and you can just follow along. You don't even have to write anything if you don't want to. It's a great way to do that. I'm gonna just, that's a cheat code, which we're going to talk about in a couple weeks anyway. So how you set your mind determines how you see yourself. Now, we're going to talk today about the settings of our mind. We're going to talk about how you can alter the settings of your mind and change them up and modify them a little bit. But I first, before we get into that, you really need to know how you see, how you should see yourself. And this is the, the bottom line on how you should see yourself. You should see yourself as God sees you. You should. You should see yourself the way that God sees you. But most of us have a skewed view of our own reality. We don't see ourselves as God sees us. But here's why. Because it's the nature of humanity to deny our identity. (laughs) It is the nature, the default nature of human beings to deny what God says about us. So God says one thing and we're like, nah, you must have somebody else, dude. (laughs) You picked the wrong guy. You picked the wrong one. Let me show you some, some times in Scripture, and we're not going to go there each time, but uh, in, over and over throughout Scripture, we see men and women of God that are called by God, but they deny what God is saying in them. They deny what God is calling them to do. There's a guy in the Old Testament named Moses, and Moses is called by God to lead the children of Israel out of slavery. And God speaks to Moses. He, Moses is out in the wilderness, and this bush catches on fire. And while the bush is burning, the voice of God begins to speak from the bush to Moses. Now, (laughs) if that's happening, don't you think God knows what he's talking about? Like, whoever was speaking to you from a burning bush out in the middle of nowhere, I would believe what they're saying. Because they're talking through a bush. I mean, it don't get much different than that. It's it's real. Like, I'm going to believe it. But Moses, here's the voice of God, and God says, Moses, I'm calling you to lead. Go to Pharaoh and say, set my people free. Let my people go. And he tells him all this, and he says, I need you to do this. And Moses says, I'm not a good speaker. And God's like, you're speaking now. He didn't say that. That's not in the Bible. If you go look for it, it's not there. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Moses is denying what God says you can do. God says, Moses, you need to go say, let my people go. And Moses is like, I can't. And God's like, who's God here? You see what I'm saying? We deny the identity that God gives us. Let me give you another example. There's another guy later on in the Old Testament. His name is Gideon. Gideon is called to do basically the exact same thing. The the people of Israel are being oppressed by the Midianites. And Gideon, this angel shows up to him. Again, if an angel shows up, I'm going to be like, okay. (laughs) And this angel shows up and says, Gideon, you're a mighty man of valor. Now, Gideon is hiding when this happens. And Gideon's like, bro, (laughs) I'm hiding. (laughs) I am not a mighty man of valor. In fact, I am the smallest, and my tribe is the least of all the ones. So how am I this? And the the angel says, go with the strength you have. And Gideon wants to deny that he's even called. Does this sound familiar? Sound like me and you, doesn't it? This happens over and over throughout Scripture that we are constantly denying what God speaks about us. But I need to let you in on a little secret. Did you know that God cannot tell a lie? (laughs) God is truth. He said, I am the way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So when God speaks, he cannot tell a lie for two reasons. For two reasons. Number one, because he exudes truth. When he speaks, he can't speak a lie. But secondly, when God speaks, if it didn't exist before, it suddenly does. I need you to get this. Before we move on and before we really tackle this mind game thing, I need you to understand this. Turn to your neighbor and say, truth. Come on, you got to say it with some gusto because that was like that was like whenever you woke up at 3 a.m. and you're like, <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I need you to wake up, turn to your neighbor, say, hey, you got to get with me. Turn to your neighbor, say, get with him. There you go, online, get with me, get with me. Here we go. This is the way I want you to say, turn to your neighbor, say, truth. When God speaks, he doesn't tell a lie because when he speaks, it comes into existence. You've got to get this. Think of how creation was made. In the book of Genesis, we see this layout of creation. And the Bible says that the word of God went forth. God speaks. Let there be light. Guess what? There wasn't light before, but because he said, there's light. Guess what happened? Light had to appear. When he says, let there be, it had to exist. So when God calls someone and says, you are called, 
It doesn't matter whether or not you're qualified. It's automatic because God can't speak a lie. Are you getting this? So when God says, dude, you're highly favored, and you're like, bro, do you see my circumstances? When God says, you are blessed, and you're like, dude, I'm in debt up to my ears. And God says, you are good. And you're like, bro, did you see what I did last night? God can't tell a lie. So it didn't matter whether or not you were good before that moment. When God speaks, it instantly becomes truth because he speaks things into existence. You got to get that. You got to hear this. So what God calls you is this. He calls you a child of God. Just a few little references. You can go look it up in the word of God. He calls you a child of God. He calls you the righteousness of God. He calls you a saint. Did you know that? The word of God calls you a saint. He calls us joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Now, whether or not you think you're qualified does not matter. Because when God speaks it, it becomes truth. Let there be, and it's there. Your identity is there simply because he had this. So if our identity is based on what God says about us, and it is, then where's the problem? The problem's not with what God says about us. It's with our minds, what we think God says about us. So here's what I need you to understand. Again, if you're taking notes, this is something worth writing down. The fight for your identity is won or lost where? Within your mind. The fight for your identity is not won or lost with what God says about you. He's already called you the righteousness of God. He's already called you a a saved person. He's already called you a saint. He's already taken care of that. So where's the fight for your identity? It's in your mind. It's in your mind. It's a mind game. I need you to understand something. You realize that the enemy cannot touch what God says about you. He can't touch it. It's like an MC Hammer song all of a sudden, man. Like, he cannot even get close to what God says about you. The enemy can't touch what God says about you, but he can mess with your mind. He can make you think that God doesn't think that. He can make you think that God never said that. And that's what the enemy does. He begins to play a mind game. He can't touch what God says, but he's going to touch what you think about what God says. I did here not too long ago, I did a little bit of research on identity theft. And, uh, and I discovered when I was doing the research at the time, identity theft in the United States of America happens every two seconds. Somebody's identity is stolen every two seconds. That's crazy. Now, for those of you that have never heard of this term, which I doubt in our culture today, but just in case, identity theft means somebody steals a social security number or something that is an identifying marker so that they can go open up like a credit card or do something in your name as if they are you. And they call it identity theft. But I got to think about it. It's really kind of inappropriately named. You know what I'm saying? Like they don't actually steal your identity. That would be like body snatcher stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like your identity is not really stolen. Your identity is intact. Let me, let me show you what I mean by this. If I had my identity stolen and somebody called, uh, Mr. Briggs, yes, we just found out your identity has been stolen. Oh, no. Yeah, Mr. Briggs, this is really a serious thing. And now you can no longer go by Mr. Briggs because your identity is now gone. You're now Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, I need to tell you what you're going to do from now. Y'all you know, get what I'm saying here? It doesn't work that way. I'm still Marcus Briggs. It doesn't work like this. It's not like all of a sudden I go home after my identity is stolen and be like, hey, guys. And they're like, oh, who are you? Oh, my bad. I forgot my identity. I'm your father. (laughs) No, it doesn't work. That My identity is intact no matter what the enemy steals from me. Oh, you got to get this. Listen, the devil can't take your identity, which is found in Christ. But what he can do is steal some identification from you. And the identifying marker for your identity in Christ is in your mind. So the enemy tries to take up real estate in your mind to convince you that what Jesus said about you is not true. I am preaching way better than you're in this room right now. <laughs> The identifying marker of your identity in Christ is found in your mind. And so the enemy goes in and he tries to steal what you think God says about you. And it really jacks us up. It is a mind game. This is what it looks like. You do something that you know you shouldn't have done. Come on, y'all. We know when we shouldn't do something, right? Like you do something that you know you shouldn't have done. And the enemy shows up and says, you shouldn't have done that, bro. And you're like, yeah, I know. And then he says something like this, and this is where he gets us. He goes, you know, 
A child of God would not have done that. You must not be a child of God. That's what it is. And then you go, you know what? A child of God wouldn't have done that. I I must not be a child of God. Now, I want you to understand something. What God calls you didn't change. (laughs) What God calls you is not conditional based on your good works. What God calls you does not change just because you screwed up. If that were the case, we would be changing our status faster than we change Facebook statuses. Bleep, 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 bleep all the time, like back and forth. But that's not the case. So all the enemy can do is convince you in your mind that something changed and that your identity has changed. Oh, come on. You've got to get this. If you could get this one thing, River Park, you could learn that the enemy, all his best effort is a lie. His best attack on you is a lie. And all he does is he comes up and he says, man, a son of God wouldn't have done that. He shows up and he says, man, yeah, I saw what you were doing over in that dark corner in the club. I saw what you were doing over there. I saw how you were treating that girl. I saw how you were doing that. And he comes up with that. And then he says, you know, a son of God wouldn't do that. A daughter of God wouldn't do that. You must not be a son or daughter of God. And every single person in this place has experienced that. Whether you realize it or not, you may have thought your identity was changing, but it wasn't. It was just in your mind. It was a mind game. And the enemy loves to trick us like that. So here it is. This is what I want you to understand. The mind game is this. Will you identify yourself with your sin or with your Savior? Will you identify yourself with your sin or with your Savior? Because most of us find ourselves identifying ourselves with the thing that we did. And we say, I must be what I've done. But that is not what God calls you. I was lost when God says, you are found. I was a sinner when God said, you are saved. He identifies me what he wants me to be, not who I do, what I do and who I am. Are you getting this? So it's a mind game that is going on in your head. This is why you need the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. Because he comes alongside to affirm who you are in Christ when the enemy comes to say, you're not that. The Holy Spirit comes along beside you to affirm and say, you're a son of God. You got this. Let me read something for you. Jesus is, he's, he's talking to his disciples. Jesus, I mean, wouldn't it be cool to be walking around with Jesus and he could affirm you all the time? Like, you know what I'm saying? You're a son of God. Little butt pat. Go get him, guys. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, you're a son of God. That would be awesome to have that affirmation. They've had this affirmation for three years. And Jesus is like, hey, guys, I'm not going to be with you much longer. So I need to get someone that can come alongside you to affirm you. It's the Holy Spirit. He's going to affirm you. And this is what he says. He's talking to his disciples in John 16, verse 8. He says, and when he has come, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, I got to be honest, even when I read that, As a young man, many of you, even when I read that, said, that does not feel like affirmation, Marcus. (laughs) That feels like confirmation that I am jacked up, bro. And look, when when I was a young man, I would read this scripture and I would feel the mind game that the enemy would play on me. I would read the word of God, and the enemy would play a mind game on me and make me read that like the Holy Spirit was convincing me that my identity was wrong. Let me show you what it says. It says, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. That's a good thing. Do you know why you have pain receptors in your body? To make you stop punching that wall. That's a good thing. Pain says, stop. That doesn't need to happen. The Holy Spirit's going to say, hey, you don't need to do that. Then it says, he's going to convict you of righteousness. Now, the way I used to read that is this. The Holy Spirit's going to convict you of sin. You shouldn't have done that. Then of righteousness. You're definitely not righteous. And of judgment. I'm going to get you. That's the way I used to read it. But it's of sin to let us know what is wrong. And then he says, and of righteousness. Why? Because it says, because I go to my father and you see me no more. Jesus is saying to his disciples, I'm not going to be here to affirm you anymore. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. It says to convict you of righteousness. (laughs) 
Have you ever been found guilty of being in right standing with God? That's what righteousness means, to be in right standing with God. And when it says he's going to convict you of righteousness, it's not saying you're not righteous. <laughs> it's saying I'm going to convict you. I'm going to convince the jury that you are guilty of being in right standing with God. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And then it says end of judgment. That's not for you. Do you know what the judgment is for? Because the ruler of this world is judged. Who's the ruler of this world? Satan. Basically, Jesus is telling his disciples, here's how it works, boys. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's going to let you know when you're doing some things that are wrong. But then right after he lets you know that that was wrong, he's going to reaffirm you. You're still a son of God. You're still a daughter of God. You're still good in my eyes, bro. And then he's going to say, and just to remind you for what you did, I'm going to punish Satan for that. That's what that says. But your mind game can mess you up. The Holy Spirit is trying to help you, but your mind game will mess you up. We have to see ourselves as God sees us. We have to see us, and how we set our mind determines how we see ourselves. How we set our mind determines how we see ourselves. I love technology. Anybody love technology? This is, this is the, the, the 9 a.m. Yeah, most of the, it'll be the people later that love the technology, and you can take that however you want to. <laughs> technology, I love it. I love maximizing technology. I, I read somewhere that we actually only use like 5% of the technology that we have the ability to use. So like take your phone, for example, you're probably not maximizing all the things that your phone can do. You're only using just a portion of it. Here a while back, I decided I wanted to maximize the portions of my phone. And somebody told me, this was a few years ago, that <clears throat> you have a favorites list on your contacts. And that by hitting do not disturb, the only people that get through with a phone call would be the people that are on your favorites list. Some of y'all are like, you preaching now, bro. How do I do that? <laughs> See, I was getting all these phone calls from random people, telemarketers, all this stuff like that, and I didn't want to hear, have those calls. I just wanted to hear from my wife. Look, so somebody showed me how to do it. I did it. I set it up, got my favorites list going, and all of a sudden now, I don't even have to look at my phone when I'm on Do Not Disturb. I can just be like, hey, girl, <laughs> how you doing? Like, you see what I'm saying? Like, it just happens like that. I don't even have to wait. I don't even have to look. I know she's there. I know it's her on the other side because it wouldn't have gotten through to me. Listen. This is so good. You got to get this. So many of us have not altered the settings of our mind to only see what God wants us to see. So we get the distractions of the world instead of just the things that God wants for us. You see, the telemarketers were still calling. I just didn't hear it. The annoying people were still calling. I just didn't hear it. All I heard was my wife. That was the only thing I got the alarms for was her. Colossians chapter 3 Paul, the same guy that wrote the book of Romans, he's talking to these other people, continuing his mind game speech. And he's talking to these people about how you used to be this way. You used to be Jack. You used to be an adulterous people. You used to be a group of people that were sexually promiscuous. You used to be a group of people that did all these crazy things. But now this is the way you should act because God has saved you. This is the way you should act. Notice this. He's saying they're saved and then he's addressing their actions. All right, now watch this. Before he gets into all that, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, he deals with it, and he says, this is how it works, guys. It takes place in your mind first. He says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek. Everybody say, seek. Seek those things which are above. Look for the things that are above. Where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind. Everybody say, set your mind. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Where's your identity? It's in Christ. We are joint heir with Christ. So if you would seek the things of God, you then you could set your mind on the things above. Then you would see yourself as God sees you because you're with Christ. Are you getting this? We have to change the settings of our mind. If we seek what God says to seek, we will see what God sees in us. But the reason many of you get tricked in the mind game is because you don't see what God sees in you because you're not looking for what God tells you to look for. You're looking for something else. You're looking for something else that's missing. 
Man, I, I, I want you to realize something that when you start following Jesus, and we have many people that are not yet followers of Jesus that go to River Park, maybe you're watching online right now. <laughs> when you start following Jesus, it's not like everything just becomes rainbows and unicorns. All of a sudden, like, oh, Jesus, woo, look at that, everything's great. Nobody cuts me off in traffic anymore. My wife's never in a bad mood. My kids now mind me. No. That doesn't work like that. And if that's what you thought salvation was, you were in for a huge disappointment. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. When you give your heart to Christ, none of that changes. What can change, though, is you begin to set your mind on where you're seated with Christ. And now you see the world that hasn't changed differently. You begin to see the world that's different because you have set your mind on things above. You have set your mind on things above. My daughter, my middle daughter, my middle child, my youngest daughter, Letty, she, uh, she, we call her the crazy cat because she's crazy. She's awesome, though. I love her. She's so creative. She has so many ways of of, of doing things. She has a creative mind. She thinks out of the box, very out of the box. Matter of fact, she has an entire imaginary family. She's my only, just so you know that I'm not crazy. She's the only kid of my three that has an imaginary family. She's the mom. And for the longest time, she had four kids and we didn't know who the father was. The other day we found out the father is babe. And that's when I discovered all I call my wife is babe. And all she calls me is babe because she just copied that. So babe is the father. Now, here's the very disappointing thing. I'm gonna have to, I need y'all to pray for me because she hasn't said that that was her husband. She just said it was her baby's daddy. So we're going to have to pray. Church, pray. <laughs> but Letty said, Letty has four kids, and I'm going to try and get it right. So she has two sets of twins, actually. The first set of twins is Molly and Light. I know. I don't know. And then the second set of twins is CC and Little Light. So here during the Corona time, we, we've been using it as an opportunity to do a whole lot of things. When we were on self quarantine, we used it as an opportunity to do a lot of things that we didn't get a whole lot of time to do. And so I was teaching all of our kids, which my oldest already knew this, but you don't cross the sidewalk. We live on a road that has a lot of fast traffic through and they all know how to ride their bikes and stuff like that. And it's like, you don't cross this line. Why? Because you could get run over by a car. They don't see you. These people don't care. They, they, they could run over you. And it was like pretty serious. And they're like, Daddy, what would happen? And the oldest, the oldest looks at Letty and she goes, you will die. I'm like, oh, dear God. So about two weeks after we did this, Letty comes running up to me and says, Daddy, Molly died. Now, I gotta be honest, as an imaginary grandparent, I don't know how to take this news. <laughs> I don't know how I'm supposed to receive this. Am I supposed to fall to my knees in tears? Am I supposed to like be weeping right now? What, what's, what's supposed to happen right now? And she says, Molly died. I'm like, uh, okay, you're taking this very well. <laughs> and so I, uh, I, I said, what happened? She said, she got ran over by a car. <laughs> this is true. I said, oh, well, and I'm trying to find out more details and she's fine. So she's like, okay, bye. <laughs> and like runs off and goes to play. Two weeks later, two weeks later, she's serving dinner to her imaginary family. She's handing it out. And I hear her say the name Molly. And I went, hey, Letty, is Molly there? And she said, yeah. I had to ask. Y'all know how I had to ask. I said, I thought she was dead. And she said, no, she's alive. She's alive. She's right here. I said, okay. Now, you want to know why Molly could be alive after being dead? Because she was only dead in Letty's mind. Some of you have callings on your life, dreams, identities that God has given you and said, you're going to do this for my kingdom. You're going to do great things. You're a son of God. <laughs> And you let that identity die. But it didn't die in reality. It only died in your mind. It only died in your mind. And anything that only dies in your mind 
can be raised again back to life again in your mind. It's a mind game. If you would just recognize that the enemy has converted your mind and changed the settings of your mind to think differently of what God has said about you. He has said that calling's alive. He has said that identity's alive. You're still a son of God. You're still my chosen one. If you would recognize that identity, it could be resurrected in your mind. (laughs) God wants you to recognize reality. And reality is you are a son of God. You're a daughter of God. Would you stand up to your feet today and give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Come on, put your hands together. Give it up like you love him. We're about to move into a time of response, which is very good because this early in the morning, sometimes it's hard to respond. And I'm going to challenge you to do something and respond. We still got some time left. The worship team's going to lead us in some worship. Maybe you're one of those people that you've been following Jesus all your life, but because you've made some mistakes, you've let some identity die in your mind and you needed to come back. You just need to recognize that it's an enemy mind game that's going on inside of you right now. God hasn't changed his thoughts about you. He hasn't changed what he thinks about you. It's a mind game. Or maybe you're not even a believer yet. You're not even a follower of Jesus yet. We want you to follow Jesus. We want you to do that simply. All you have to do is say, Lord, I believe in you and I want to follow you and begin that journey and we want to help. So if you want to take some next steps, we we want to help you do that. And you're probably thinking, now what do I do? And here's what you do. You text the word, now what, to 97000. It's a way that we can help you get some material so that you can take some next steps. If you're watching online, the same goes for you. We want to help you do that. Next thing that you can do during this response time is if you need prayer, our prayer teams are going to be on the sides over here. Or if you're watching online, our prayer team is waiting for your responses right now. If you just request prayer, they're waiting there to pray with you right now. Or maybe, maybe you want to give during this time. We believe giving is an act of worship here at River Park. It's a way that we respond to God. We believe it's, we don't believe it's just handing something off. We believe it's actually an act of worship. Maybe that's what you want to do in this time. Maybe you just want to sit there and worship and dwell on the things of God. Maybe you need God to speak to you about your identity a little bit more so that you can convince your mind what he says about you. Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. I'm going to challenge you to do that. Pastor Jeremy's going to come up and dismiss you here in about two to three minutes. But I'm going to challenge you. If you have to go, we understand. But if you can't, if you don't have to, I'm going to challenge you to just wait here just for a minute while we lead you in worship and we respond to the presence of God. Let me pray for you. Holy Spirit, we need your affirmation right now. We need to be affirmed that we are sons and daughters of God. It's because of that affirmation, from that point of affirmation, that we can actually act out the things that the sons and daughters of God do. So Lord, I pray right now for affirmation, God, that people that are in this room that think that you changed your mind about them, convince them now, Holy Spirit, that that hasn't changed. It's just in their mind. Those of us that have not given our hearts to you, Lord, let us set our minds on you now. Let us repent, come to you right now, God, and reset our minds back on you so that we can experience your presence, so that we can follow in your kingdom, And let it be established here on earth through us. I pray right now that you would speak louder than ever, God, as we respond to what you're doing in us right now. In Jesus' name I pray.